Go Ryan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adamson. So uh, this is a complicated area because, um, as you already heard, uh, genetics plays a major role in our reactivity to drugs. And I'm going to show you uh, some data that is, while I agree mostly most of what uh, Roland just said, uh, it's, it's a complicated area and there's a lot of individual variation, as you see in a few minutes. So first of all, I want to give you some uh, definitions. I just finished uh, seven years as chair of the DSM-5 uh, committee to revise the DSM. The DSM is the major classification of mental illness, uh, which is used all over the world. And uh, we recently corrected a lot of the errors that were in it, and uh, we published it uh, last May. So now the official version is DSM-5. Um, so uh, first of all, in DSM-4, we thought there was abuse and addiction, sort of in a severity. Uh, you, you went from, a, from use to abuse to addiction. But we now know that's not true. We examined 150,000 diagnostic interviews, and it's more of a progressive phenomenon going from use gradually to addiction. So now we have 11 different symptoms, and the more symptoms you have, the more severe. So we generally say uh, two symptoms is mild, uh, up to four is moderate, and uh, over that, up to 11 is severe. Uh, and that goes, that goes for all the, all the drugs. Um, and uh, here's the, the, the symptoms. And uh, tolerance and withdrawal are the first two. And they have an asterisk. And the asterisk means that it depends on whether the medication is prescribed by a physician. Because it turns out that tolerance and withdrawal are normal. It happens to every one of us. And it happens when we take all sorts of different drugs, particularly sedative drugs. I'll show you a list, uh, antihypertensive drugs, antidepressants. Um, and tolerance and dependence can be associated with withdrawal, but that's not addiction. Addiction is drug-seeking behavior. So these are all the uh, symptoms. And actually, R Roland uh, mentioned these. Uh, the only one that we changed was we eliminated legal problems because it wasn't useful, it didn't do any good. And um, we added craving. Craving is perhaps the only psychiatric symptom for which we have a neurophysiological basis because it shows up with classical conditioning. Your brain responds to cues associated with your drug of choice and also with other things, so probably with you know, um, food or uh, a sex object or something, but we can show that when a former alcoholic or a drug-free drug alcoholic or cocaine addict is shown cues, their brain lights up, there's a blood supply to the specific areas of the brain that you've already seen, and then there's already evidence that dopamine is released, um, and this happens before they ever get the drug, and that creates all kinds of anticipation. So addiction is a complicated thing. Anyway, so. So these are all the symptoms. I'm, I'm skipping over them fast because I want to get you know, to the discussion. Um, but anyway, these are, the, the, the more of these that you have, the more severe the condition is according to the way we use it. But notice, not counted if prescribed by a physician. One of the most common forms of drug problems today are um, problems with prescription opioids. And that, that can be normal if you have pain uh, but a lot of people who are just taking the medication according to what their doctor said, they're not addicted, they're just taking in the right dose, but if they show evidence of tolerance and withdrawal, because of the word that has been used since the 1980s, namely dependence, sure, they have pharmacological dependence, and I was on that committee too, and I said, you can't use dependence, it's already taken. Pharmacologists have been using it for many, many years, but in fact, uh, people didn't want to use the word addiction. So that's why we call it drug use disorder or cocaine use disorder, but we don't call it addiction because it was thought by some of the people who well, would be, it would be unfair to our patients to, to use that word. Um, so anyway, tolerance is a normal reaction and caffeine is the one of the drugs that shows very, very rapid tolerance and there's very good evidence for withdrawal, and um, Roland already showed it. But the problem is it may not be as common as you think because of the kinds of studies that have been done. 
So um, w this is what we teach medical students and how to prescribe medication. We teach them how to treat pain. And you always taper medications, no abrupt stopping. Um, there's a, a lot of effects of drug metabolism. SSRIs, antidepressants, may require months of withdrawal. Caffeine disorder was, uh, withdrawal disorder was added to DSM-5. There was a lot of resistance to that. Some of my colleagues thought, it's so trivial. Don't, you know, we, the APA is very sensitive to being criticized for making pathology out of normal things like shyness. Um, well, but uh, uh, with the help of Roland, we got it in. You know, we, we showed a lot of evidence that withdrawal exists. But we didn't put in caffeine use disorder. As he said, we put it in the appendix to stimulate research. And we're not, most of us are not prepared to say that there's such a thing as caffeine addiction, but there is definitely caffeine withdrawal. Um, so this is caffeine withdrawal, and I'm going to skip over this because you already heard a good lecture on it. Uh, but it's, it, these are some of the symptoms. Um, and, but, it, but, but, it, but it ranges from very mild to very severe. And Roland has studied some very severe uh, groups of patients. Now, here's a study which is the only one of its kind, as far as I know. And this study was organized by Dr. Peter Dews, who passed away last year. And he was a very experienced behavioral pharmacologist who was also a member of the National Academy. And I helped him with this study. And he and I were both impressed with the fact that we had done a lot of placebo-controlled studies in our careers. And uh, I've especially done um, placebos with uh, drugs that sometimes produce psychosis and all sorts of things. And you have to give the placebo group the same consent form. And the consent form produced a lot of symptoms in the placebo groups. And you can see this in the PDR. If you go to the PDR today, you'll see where there's a list of adverse reactions for every drug there. And there's always a placebo group. And you'll see a lot of headache that people have on placebo. And you'll see insomnia. And you'll see nervousness. All of these nonspecific uh, effects. Um, so you know, we wanted to see what the real effects of caffeine withdrawal are. So we did a study that uh, we, we did um, uh, with getting an initially a, a population of 11,000 people uh, who, um, com some of whom com co consume caffeinated beverages on a daily basis, 4,000, in this case, a total of 6,000 with males and females. Uh, and then we saw, we asked them about problem stopping caffeine. And here are the ones who had problems, 296, 456. But at no point in this part of the study did we tell them we were interested in caffeine withdrawal. Um, this was a study of the aroma of coffee, the taste of coffee, the appearance of coffee. And we uh, were prepared to give them all sorts of different kinds of coffee. But what, the independent variable was the amount of caffeine that they were getting. And so um, you know, we asked them about caffeine withdrawal. And everyone that we randomized told us, with not knowing you know, that we were, if this was really a distractor, not knowing that we were interested in withdrawal, um, they told us um, about you know, those who had, what percentage had enough withdrawal that uh, interfered with normal activity and so forth. So then we took the ones who reported withdrawal and we randomized them into three groups. Uh, first of all, we stabilized them for uh, a, a week or 10 days on uh, all on roughly the same dose, 400 to 500 milligrams per day of, of caffeine. Um, and again, they didn't know this is what we were doing. And um, then we randomized them into three groups. One group continued on the same dose of caffeine all the way through. Uh, the other group had an abrupt withdrawal. It went from the, say, four or 500 milligrams of caffeine to zero, and that's this group right here. Another group had a gradual reduction. We had done the same study with methadone, and, and we found very similar results. People can't tell when you reduce it uh, gradually. 
And um, we also asked them a symptom questionnaire. Now, we didn't actually have any in this study, any headache, but we were trying to get sensitive uh, withdrawal symptoms. And, and these aren't necessarily the same people who got into a study of caffeine withdrawal because they may have thought, you know, and they were on much higher doses, I think, in most of the studies that uh, Roland looked at um, or presented. So, but here, you know, energy, alert, how did your work go today? What was your leisure, leisure time? And we also asked them about, you know, the smell of the coffee, the taste of the coffee, the appearance of the coffee. So this was a complete distractor. The only thing we were concerned about was caffeine withdrawal. And here's the results. Um, the, the group that uh, had the um, uh, continuous same dose of caffeine remained symptom free. The group that had the sudden reduction had, uh, the females had symptoms. In other words, they, they lost some of their alertness and so forth. But the males didn't show anything. And this is a group that got the gradual reduction the way that we did in our methadone study and with a very similar response. So um, I present this as probably the only study of its kind where, and, and you know, the people were only on 400 to 500 milligrams of caffeine a day, but uh, they didn't know that they were being tested for caffeine withdrawal. Um, this is the caffeine use disorder that would be if, it, if, it, if the research shows up, um, caffeine addiction, which is uh, what uh, I, um, Roland has found some really interesting cases, and he's let me listen to some of them, where they probably would meet these criteria. And so we're, we're going to see what happens. It may be that there's a genetic factor that makes some people develop this, which you could call caffeine addiction. But I think that, it, at least in based on our study, that the um, great majority of people uh, don't have th the same kind of severity. Um, and so this is caffeine use disorder. This is in the um, appendix of the DSM-5. Essentially, this is taking the uh, other symptoms of drug use dis disorder and uh, putting them in, in proper terminology for, um, for caffeine. Um, so. That's all that I want to say. I'm not totally disagreeing with everything that Roland said, but I do think that you have to recognize that there's a certain proportion of the population who can develop this kind of you know, uh, syndrome of, of perhaps caffeine addiction. But we didn't find them starting off with 11,000 people in our study. So um, I think I'll stop at this point. The third speaker is uh, Amelia Ria. Uh, she's associate professor of uh, Behavioral and Community Health, and Director of a Center on Young Adult Health and Development at the University of Maryland. 